Welcome back to our series, Prairie Avenue Spotlight, where we will showcase the surviving houses on historic Prairie Avenue in Chicago's South Loop. This week, we will look at the history and architecture of the home of Marshall Field, Jr., including the mystery that has surrounded it for more than a century. Our story actually begins next door at the home of Marshall Field, Sr., which was completed in 1873 from designs by the New York architect Richard Morris Hunt. Field Jr. was six years old when he moved into the house with his parents and his younger sister Ethel. In 1883, Arthur Murray purchased the property we are at today and hired the architect Solon S. Beeman to design a house combining elements of the Queen Anne and Richardsonian Romanesque styles, utilizing red brick and sandstone. Beeman was just 30 years old but had already established a solid reputation based on his design of the town of Pullman on Chicago's far south side three years earlier. The Murray House formed the core of what would become a much larger home later on. In 1890, Marshall Field Jr. was married to Albertine Huck, the daughter of a German brewer. The ceremony took place at the Field Mansion and was presided over by Patrick Fian the first Catholic Archbishop of Chicago. Marshall Field Sr. purchased the Murray House next door and gave it to his son and daughter-in-law, although they chose to live in England during most of the 1890s. In 1902, Daniel Burnham's firm was hired to significantly enlarge and remodel the home. The entire left side of the house, seen in this image, constituted the addition while the original house, seen to the right, was remodeled, including new dormers and other details to give it a unified appearance. An interesting part of the remodeling was the carved capitals on the squat double columns by the front entrance. Faces carved in amongst the foliage are said to depict the various members of the field family. Some are now badly worn and hard to see, but a few are still clearly visible. The new house contained more than 20,000 square feet of space, including the large addition on the left, which featured a ballroom and a huge coach house with a regulation-sized squash court above. Marshall Field Sr. deeded a 20-foot strip of land to his son to permit this addition to be as large as possible. The family did not enjoy their new home for long. On November 22, 1905, as the official story goes, Marshall Field Jr. accidentally shot himself in the house while cleaning a gun. He was rushed to Mercy Hospital where he lingered for days. Almost immediately, rumors circulated that he had been shot at the Everly Club, Chicago's most exclusive brothel located a few blocks to the west. As the son of Chicago's wealthiest citizen, Jr.'s condition made every newspaper headline as he continued to deteriorate. On November 27th, five days after he was shot, he died from his wounds. He was just 38 years old. Marshall Field Jr. was laid to rest in the family plot at Graceland Cemetery. The beautiful monument is the work of architect Henry Bacon and sculptor Daniel Chester French, the same two men who would later collaborate on the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. The widow and three children stayed with the senior Marshall Field for a period of time and then moved to England. Albertine remarried, but died just a decade later at the age of 43. Her body was returned to Chicago for burial in the Field family plot at Graceland Cemetery. In 1909, the house was sold for $40,000 to Dr. Milton Pine, who established the Gatlin Institute for the treatment of drug and alcohol addiction. There was no zoning ordinance yet in Chicago to prevent such a thing from happening. And this early conversion from residential to commercial use signaled the rapid decline of Prairie Avenue, which would follow. The house was used for institutional purposes for the next 70 years, its final occupant being the Monterey Convalescent Home, which closed in the mid-1970s. The Chicago Architecture Foundation, which at the time owned and operated Glessner House, 
acquired the building to protect it until it could be landmarked. In 1981, the house was purchased by a firm which intended to restore it. The first job was to tear out all of the later additions to see what remained. Although it had been abused during the decades, much of the original detailing survived, including wood trim and elaborate plaster ceilings. The original oak staircase and railing were found inside walls that had been built later on. Wood stripping, as seen in the right photo, revealed the beautiful oak that looked as good as the day it had been installed. Pulling up the linoleum on the first floor revealed intricately detailed parquet floors that required only minimal cleaning to bring back their original luster. Some details, like the Lincrusta wall covering in the front entry vestibule, had never been covered over and required more extensive treatment. The restoration did not go far before the project was abandoned. The house was boarded up and it slipped into decay over the next 20 years, with a portion of the roof falling in and water infiltrating from above and through poorly secured windows. Vandals broke into the building, ripping out building materials that could be resold and defacing elements like the beautiful hand-carved sandstone fireplace in the basement level billiard room. In 1993, the house was purchased by Ed Magnus for $60,000. He renovated the original squash court above the coach house as his living quarters, while leaving the rest of the building boarded up. When plans began to come together for a new townhouse development to the north, the developers put pressure on the city for something to be done with the dilapidated building. By 2003, the property had been purchased by a developer and work was underway to restore the exterior while converting the interior into six luxury condominiums. The interior was so badly deteriorated that original details could not be preserved, but the basic floor plan was followed while carefully carving up the space into multiple units. The first residents moved in during 2004. Today, looking at the beautifully maintained exterior, it is hard to imagine the rough history the house has seen. Had it not been landmarked in 1979 as part of the Prairie Avenue Historic District, the building would most certainly have been raised years ago. That concludes our look at the Marshall Field Junior House. We hope you will join us next week for our new installment of Prairie Avenue Spotlight.